dear friends, students, alumni, institutions, colleagues, professors, there are many families, extended families among the audience. My name is Maria Kartunen, and I'm a board member at the Saastamoinen Foundation. On behalf of the Foundation and Aalto University, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our keynote lecture with Peter Wallenberg, Jr., the chair of Knut and Alice Wallenberg's foundation and several other family foundations. Few words regarding the Sastamonen Foundation. The, the foundation is a family foundation, likewise Wallenberg's, whose primary purpose is to support and award grants to arts, sciences, and social projects. The total amount of grants awarded last year was 6.5 million euros. Our operating model is based on long-term partnerships, collaboration, and networking, both in Finland and internationally. Our main partner in Finland are Aalto University, University of Eastern Finland, the University of Arts, and Espo Museum of Modern Art, Emma. Regarding research, our focus is currently on neuroscience, epilepsy research, water research, bioeconomics, and artist pedagogy in fine art. We actively acquire contemporary art and contribute, contribute to important platforms that affect the wellness of youth and art. But before we dive into today's topic, the Wallenberg ecosystem, active ownership and long-term commitment, let's come back to Mr. Peter Wallenberg, Jr. Stepping out, for example, from the boards of the holding companies Investor and FAM, he's now concentrating on the work of the 16 foundations that has been around for 100 years, and annually the granting is approximately 250 million euros. He, together with his cousin, Marcus, and brother Jacob, are responsible for introducing the next generation of the Wallenberg family into the family-linked operations. He's also involved in engineering industry and hotel industry, and for example, chairing the Grand Hotel in Stockholm. Power means responsibility, that we know, and this has been central for the Wallenberg family for generations. Wallenberg motto is Esse non videri, to act, not to seem to be, which signifies that you are to move constantly forward in a constructive way, while taking responsibility and making every effort to get the job done. As many, as a man of many surprises, Peter is also linked to the world-class chefs and hotel managers, and he is known for his passion for cars even running his own professional racing team. I'm not telling you more, but I remind Peter that it's your responsibility also to tell why you are called poker. Before we start, I also have the pleasure to remind you that there will be a moderated discussion between Peter Jr., poker, the Wallenberry sixth generation, and Mr. Karri Kaitua after the keynote. But now, Peter, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I never had such an introduction. Um, maybe I should then start off by telling you why I'm called poker. And it has nothing to do with gambling, okay? Uh, it was actually my grandfather who said, when I was a very small child, and he was, and my grandmother were standing on their heads, and I was just looking at them. He said, this guy has a poker face. So he started to call me poker. Uh, and that stuck. So I have to say that uh, when I studied at the university in the United States, the second year I was there, my student ID said poker Wallenberg and nothing else. So. I'm getting used to the name, to be honest with you. As I said, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's the first time I'm in Finland to talk about our ecosystem. But when one looks a little bit into 
uh, the fa our family and our relation with Finland. I should have been here many years ago, but let's do that now. Now, who am I? I am a proud member of the fifth generation, as said. Uh, I took another route than most of the family members. In my generation, the older generation usually pointed with their whole hand and said, this is what you're supposed to do, and you do it. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to have a summer job as a busboy at the Grand Hotel at the age of 14. And after that, I told my father and my grandfather that my ambition in life was to be the most well-educated piccolo in the world. My grandfather did not approve of my comments. He said that, no, 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 no. You should do like everybody else. You should be in business. But I had a very supportive father who said that you should do what you really want to do, or you will never do a good job. It took some years before my grandfather actually accepted that I did study hotel and restaurant management when he realized that the service industry is an industry and not only has to do with wine and, and uh, uh, food. So I got along pretty well with my, with my grandfather. I studied at the University of Denver. We didn't have any Finns there. There was about 200 Norwegians, but no Finns. But otherwise, it was a pretty Scandinavian school. I was fortunate enough to work 30 years within the service industry, running smaller properties, worked for larger corporations, and ended my service career as the CEO of the Grand Hotel in Stockholm. I got the job when I was only like 30, and I said, I don't want the job. What am I going to do afterwards? You can only be a CEO here for five, maybe, maximum, seven years. And I was too young for this. But I took the job because it was so challenging. And I got stuck there for almost 15, 16 years or something like that. But I, at the, the same time, I started to work more with what the family is all about. And that is, of course, the, the family foundations. So I started as a board member of some of the smaller foundations and realizing that what the family was standing for and what the foundations were doing was something that really attracted me. So I actually quit being in the service industry and started to work full time for the foundations. Today, I'm the chairman of the largest Knut and Alice. I'm also the chairman of, of uh, one of the three largest, and some, I don't know by now, 12 of the other foundations, but I will tell you more about that. Yes, I do like cars, but I don't have fancy cars in my garage. I have two Saabs, one from 78 and one from 2005, but I love driving fast. And I was working in the service industries, that's 24-7, realizing that I was killing myself. I, when I turned 40, I said, I need to find something that takes me away from the daily business. So I took my racing license. And of course, just to race cars, that's no fun. So together with another young guy, I started a race team, realizing that one was not very professional within the racing industry in Sweden. And we said that we need to help youngsters and females to get into racing. And we need to develop racing to something new. Now, the first female we had in our racing team was actually a Finnish girl, Emma Kimmelainen. How many of you, knew, you know who Emma is? Yeah, she's on television now. We brought her there. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was just to show that this sport is for everyone. Today, my little racing team is leaders in te technological development. So we're actually building all electrical race cars for the Swedish Touring Car Championship of 2023. We built our first electrical racing car already in 2018. So that's pretty cool. But I spend maybe four hours a week. I have very good people working with that. Now, talking about the family. Our family started Stockholm's Bank in 1856. Our first relation with Finland was in what? 1870, something like that? Between the bank and the institutions in Finland. In 1877, during the recession, 
the bank who had lent out money to private enterprises and the, and the businesses were not doing too well. Instead of putting them in bankruptcy, they took shares in the companies. So the bank was suddenly the owners of large corporations like Atlas Diesel, today Atlas Coco, and others. And in 1916, the government of Sweden said, banks cannot own companies. So they started Investor AB. Now we're getting into the foundations. Knut and Alice, they, were, they didn't have any kids. They were extremely socially active during their lifetime. They helped universities to build buildings. They helped to build libraries, libraries like Stockholm Library, the City Hall of Stockholm. And they helped people with disabilities. And when they got older, they said, we don't just want to give our money to the rest of the family. We want to start something that, that can continue our work in social questions and in research and education. So they started Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. And that was in 1917. So we've been running a little bit more than 100 years. And what have we done? And what are we trying to do? This is my cousin and my brother. The one with the glasses is my brother. The other one is my cousin. What we are trying to do is to continue what the family has been doing all the time. And that is to be long-term responsible owners of companies that we are engaged in. And we do that through our board work to start off with. But I will show you a little bit more about that. And when everybody talks about the Wallenberg Sphere and they talk about us as individuals, that's not really true. The sphere as such is the 16 foundations. Everything is owned by the 16 foundation. We as private people, we don't own anything in that sense. Just so you know, everything we do, we do for the foundations. This is what we call our ecosystem. We as a family in the middle, we have the final commitment or work to see to it that the system works. We are represented on the boards of the 16 foundations and for the holdings that the foundation have invested in. Today, the foundations have invested their money in Investor as a public investment company and in our own holding company called Wallenberg Investments AB. 100% of all the dividends that we get from those investments goes back to the foundations. 80% of that we give out for grants on a yearly basis. 20% we're allowed to reinvest. And that is, of course, one of the reasons that we've been around for so long. It's the positive part of running a foundation in Sweden. We don't have to, like in the States, for example, give away part of our capital on a yearly basis. In Sweden, we can continue to develop and reinvest. These are some of the companies that we have in our portfolios. We see our Finnish connection, both through in FAM, our ownership in Storenzo, and in Investor, of course, with Wärtsele. But most of these companies, as you know, are very active, both in Sweden, Finland, and the rest of the world. Our newest investment is Navigar Ventures, which actually Fred, who is here in the next, from the next generation, is working for, but where we try to help Swedish researchers to be able to start commercial activities through their research, something that has been lacking in Sweden there's not a lack of capital in Sweden, but there is a lack of long-term capital. Three to five years, easy. A researcher need 10, 15. We don't, haven't had that. So from a foundation point of view, we have started this to try to help give uh, uh, some funds to, see, to do future proofing or, or uh, to see if it's a commercial vi viable uh, products that they have done and then we can give them and do some investment to start smaller companies. We're not supposed to be owners full-time. We're there to see to it that they can start. But Fred will 
say a little bit more. Then we have the blue dot in the middle. Nobody wants to own that, so the foundations have to take care of the airline. But that's the way it is. It's part of the challenge. Now, these are the 16 foundations. I'm not going to go through all of them. I will focus on Knut and Alice when I go forward. But I usually, when I show this picture, I, I try to tell you a little bit, just so you understand that all of these foundations are, in one way or another, giving grants to research and education, but in different fields. So I usually talk about Berit. Berit is down here on the left. Berit was alive when I was a kid. And she was a pretty scary lady, to be honest with you. When we came to family dinners, she came, you know, short hair, big feet, uh, in sandals. Um, she had a mail sack as a dress, and she didn't like kids. So every time we came there, we run into another room. So my respect for her was lacking, I would say. But when I started to work for the foundations, I realized that she was an, an art historian, an archaeologist, and a photographer. And she had started her own foundation when she was still alive and collected the money, a lot of money, never got married, didn't have any kids. And even though that is a very small foundation, money-wise, it is the most important foundation for Swedish universities when it comes to archaeology and the history of the arts. So I have a huge respect for Berit today. I wish I had known that when, I was, when she was still alive. But that's just to show you a little bit of the width of how the foundations do and how we work. So let's go into Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. We give, we give out, uh, now we have it in Swedish kronos, is that okay? You can come, we're sorry, we're not part of that plan yet. But uh, anyway, uh, we try to give out uh, around, or we do, we have been able to, give out uh, around 2 billion Swedish kronos on a yearly basis. And we've given out 35 billion since we started in 2017. And as you can realize, it's been a hockey stick uh, kind of a reaction when it comes to the, the, the size of the grants uh, during the years. Now, we are giving grants to basic research. We start early, OK? And we do it mainly within uh, medicine, technology, and the natural sciences. So this is, you know, the fundamental of everything is where we want to be. We're long-term, we look for excellent researchers, and we try to see to it that we also find strategic projects that the foundation can be part of, and I will show you a little bit about that. The statues of the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation says, and we use a very British word, Landsgangelit, no, I'm just kidding. It's a very old Swedish word, which is part of the original statues. We didn't use it, but a couple of years ago, we realized that it's actually a Swedish word that says a lot about what we're really doing. The betterment of. Everything that we do should be for the betterment of Sweden and nothing else. So that is very important for us. And what do we stand for? What are we looking for? How do we work? As I said, we talk about basic science. We're very long term in our project. Our financing for researchers and research projects are very long term. We give researchers full freedom. We don't hang over their back. If they get a grant from us, we know that the peer review system that we have including 300 researchers around the world that help us to evaluate the applications, if they get a grant, we want to give them total freedom. We trust them. But through our system, we also help to see to it that we raise the competence at Swedish universities. And what do I mean by that? In a lot of our projects, and I will show you that a little bit later, we also see to it that the university actually can bring in foreign researchers to help Swedish research in its own development. And yes, we do help in innovation. Since we started Navigare, it means that our system can also help to see to it that Sweden, who is leading in Europe when it comes to patents, 
but we're the worst in Europe when it comes to actually using the patents for commercial value. So we're trying to help there too. When I started to travel around the universities, I visited the Swedish university on a yearly basis. One of the first years, I met these female researchers. And I talked to her about you know, how it is, how does it work with the foundation. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, our main thing is that we know we're going to discover things that we didn't even know we were looking for. And that was like, for me, it was that like, wow, that's so cool. That's what research is all about. But historically, that was not the way it was. It used to be that researcher actually applied for funds for research projects where they were already in the application stated what they were actually going to do and what the end result would be, which meant that we had taken away the freedom of the researchers to be, how do you say it, more engaged in finding new ways. For us, as I said, total freedom, see to it that the researchers really try to find ways of reaching what they want, but <coughs> Don't forget, whatever you find on the way could be as interesting as the main thought you had. So don't never forget that. I think that that's pretty cool, right? Everybody should think like that. So what kind of grants do we give out? We give out uh, individual grants and we give out project grants. Both to those two areas, it's applications that actually comes from the universities, where the researchers at the university ask the principal of the university to send in an application to us. We then send that out to a peer review system, the 300 researchers, including Nobel laureates that help us to evaluate the applications that we do get. After that, if they get the money, as I said, we don't hear from them ever. Really. They like the freedom. Anyway, but in this system, we also realized a couple of years ago that Sweden was actually losing a whole generation of young researchers. And why was that? It was because the way that people or the universities applied for funds was in groups. And when the group got the funding, the group was split. And the elderly researchers took the funds and made their research. So the younger researchers in Sweden started to go abroad to find their own funding. So Sweden was actually losing a whole generation of young researchers. So we went to the universities and we said, we want to start a program that we call Academy Fellows, where you should tell us which young uh, um, researchers you would like to be part of this. But 40% of the researchers that each university sends in to us has to be Swedes active abroad that we want to bring back, or young international researchers that can help Swedish research. Today, we have 285 of these. They get three million a year for five years. They can apply a second time. Of course, the elderly researchers got really pissed that we were pointing at the young and said that they were better than them. And we said, no, they're not, but you have had the funds, but you haven't brought in the younger. But we realized that the elderly uh, uh, researchers had a lot of ideas that they had never dared to apply funds for. So we said, we'll do the same deal with you. You get three million a year for five years. If you open your drawer, and bring out the really stupid ideas that you never dared to ask for funds for and try it out. So we did. This has been extremely successful. And that's what I mean by helping to develop competence at the universities. We feel that's pretty good. When it comes to projects, I only mention one, and that's the human protein atlas. How many of you use the human protein atlas? What? No, I'm serious. <laughs> this is a Swedish researcher uh, who, you know, 20 years ago, we're starting to see to it that we can actually have on open source have the human protein atlas. Finding all the proteins, putting them online, 
doing it open source so that all researchers around the world could use this for their own research. This was on its way to end up on an international basis because it was so interesting. Then my father, being the chairman of the foundation at the time, said that, no, one day we have to say stop when it comes to international foundations and other buying Swedish research and moving it abroad. So he took the decision that our foundation should, should finance this and see to it that it stayed in Sweden. Today, for researchers in medicine and others, this is extremely important. I met the head of the American Cancer Society. He said, by this, a researcher can now go in on a computer, open source, find the protein that he needs for his research, and continue to do the research. Before, they first had to identify the protein, find it, and use it for their research. So they say, you save plenty of times by letting this be open source and open for everyone. So that's pretty nice, too. Strategic grants, it's today one of the larger parts that we're doing. Here, it is areas, and I will uh, tell you a bit more about it. This is areas where we realize that Sweden, Swedish universities, are lacking in some areas. That's not pointing our fingers, it's a dialogue between us and the universities of where do we need to focus in Sweden? Where are we lacking behind? Where are we not putting enough funds, politically or privately, in which areas and why? So we started a strategic project where we said, we can help to see to it that it starts, and then we'll take it from there. Sweden being a very small country with limited resources in everything that we do. This is probably the most important things that I talk about when I'm out doing presentations like this. And that is that we need to see to it that we work together. We need to see to it that academia, politics, business, public sectors at large go together. We cannot do this in each individual part. We need to talk to each other and see to it that we put the funds in the right place. Not saying that we always put it in the right place, but we feel it's the best way for Sweden, with limited funds, to be able to continue to grow. So to talk a little bit about the strategic projects that we do, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but we started already in 2009, where we realized, just so you understand the way that we think, we realized that the Swedish forest and the Swedish forest company, including Stora Enzo, were not really talking about what should we do with the forest. Nobody wants to buy our papers, so what are we going to do? So we, we had a, a, a conference in Stockholm where we asked researchers from around Sweden to come and say, what are you doing? What kind of research are you doing? And what should we use the, the, uh, the wood for, or the, the forest for? We realized that there was a lot of knowledge and very good research being done all over Sweden. But the researchers had ne never met each other, never had a dialogue about, you know, I'm doing this, what are you doing? How can we work together? No, didn't exist. So we said, let's start Wallenberg Wood Science Center. It's a collaboration between Chalmers University in Gothenburg and the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. We invited all companies within the forest industry to be part of this, to see to it that let's together see what we can do. None of the forest company wanted to be part of it. They said, no, nah, that's academia, that's shit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can do this much, much better. So you do your thing, we'll do our thing. The stage is too big, but you can see this a little bit, right? It looks a little bit like plastic or something. It's actually a birch. This came out 10 years ago, close to, where the researcher realized that 
they could actually make something that is like plastic out of wood. And we can use that not today for bottles, because you cannot bend it yet, but you can use it instead of glass. Today it's completely clear. You can put uh, 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 solar cells on it and put it on top of buildings, etc. When this started to come out, all the forest companies were part of the research again. They came back and go, maybe we should be part of this. They actually do something good. Today, they do glue completely made out of material from the forest, actually now being tried by one of the largest uh, furniture manufacturers in Sweden, I'm not going to name any names, to see if it works, uh, and a lot of other things. But that was just to show that with very small funds, and to be honest, only 15 researchers to start off with, we're able to do a lot. And today, 10 companies are part of this, doing research in this area. Now, WASP is our largest. It's all about AI, machine learning. Today, we even have cybersecurity and others in uh, that. Now, we'll go in a little bit further into that a little bit later on. VACT, quantum computers. How many of you use those? How many of you understand them? Uh, somebody's trying a little bit like this. Could you, could you help, please, come up, tell me? <laughs> My problem is that we have Per Delsing in, at Chalmers in Gothenburg, who is a genius. He's, he was used by all the international players when it came to starting to build a quantum computer. And we realized, are we actually going to let somebody else take this knowledge? Or should we help and see if we can do it ourselves in Sweden? So we said, yes, we do. And every time I go down to Per Delsing, and I leave there and I go, God, now I really understand what he's talking about. And then I go back a month later and I go, I don't understand shit, sorry. It's so complicated. But we've gone so far, so today we have a 25 qubit computer working, which is really good. So we actually built another one that can now be used by Swedish institutes and industry to start to learn how can we use a quantum computer in the future. The goal is 100 cubic, cu <laughs> even the terminology is difficult. Anyway, we're doing pretty good. And yes, it was foresighted by the foundations to say, yes, we want to be part of this. It is complicated, it is expensive, but we need, we need to try. WASP HS. When I talk about WASP, which is AI and all that, we also realize that there is a lot of social questions when it comes to AI. A lot of people are afraid, they don't understand what they're going to mean, what does it mean for work, you know, all of that. So we started a research project around humanities and society, where we go into everything that has to do with ethics, judicial questions, and what does it really mean for society when we start to work with AI. So we were actually able to, to uh, get the leading researcher in the world to move to Umeå and start her research project there. So we're doing pretty good. Data-driven life science. We've been part of life science for a very long period of time. SciLife Lab in Stockholm is partly financed by us. But we also realized through the WASP and all of the AI machine learning, there was a lot of things that life science also needed to learn when it came to modern technology. So we started a, a, a project around that too. And then our latest, which is VICE, Sustainable, sustainable Materials for a Sustainable World. And I will go a little bit further into that. Now, I told you a little bit about WASP. And uh, it was, and still is, the largest research project in Sweden. We will all together go in with around 6 billion Swedish kronos uh, during the years into this. And when we started it, our first grant was five. And on the same day that we launched this and went out to the press and said, we're starting this at Linköping University together with six other universities at the time, and we're inviting 
uh, industry to be part of this research project. And we're putting in 5 billion Swedish kronas. At the same time, the German councillor had a press conference where she said that I will put in 5 billion euro at this university for one project in AI. You go, OK, now we know what we have to compete against. Uh, but at least we, we got this going. Today, it's more than 80 companies being part of this. Does that mean that these companies can come to this research group and say, we need to find a solution for my problem here? No. We don't do any applied research at this, in these projects. It's all basic. So all the companies being part of this is there because they need to learn or they can contribute in one way or another in the basic part of how to use these questions going forward. So that's the way it works. And as you can see, yes, we do work with foreign uh, universities. Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, NTU, and Alto. Yeah, be proud. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But this is, of course, a way for us to see to it that we also widen and see to it that not only Swedish universities, but through the, the, the cooperation with other universities, we interact and see to it that we use the knowledge in a better way. And when it comes to Alto, yes, the relation between Saab, Alto, and with our foundations is, of course, there. And it's very, very uh, promising. And my understanding is that everybody at Alto is happy about that. Say yes. Yeah, good. Good. <laughs> anyway, then we have our latest, sustainable materials. When we, when we started this, we got a lot of questions. Like, oh, you're so late getting into the sustainable questions. Uh, you go, no, uh, the word sustainable is new. Uh, talking about the environment uh, and, and what we do right and wrong is something that has been on for a long period of time. We've been uh, financing research when it comes to the climate for the past 30 years, at least. Uh, we've been up in uh, the Arctic digging in permafrost for many, many years. So this is once again just a way for us to realizing that there is a lot of really, really good research being done at different universities, at different faculties, but there is no communication, no use in the combined knowledge that is around at universities. That's the reason we started this. This is going very rapidly, and in Sweden, we already have batteries made out of paper. We already have paper where you can actually just put solar cell, print solar cells on regular paper, put it in you know, rolls, and send them out to catastrophe areas if needed. Will they last for long? No, but they're usable for a short period of time, and we can do it. <coughs> so it's the same thing here. We believe that. Through a project like this, we can help in bringing knowledge together, see to it that you do changes more rapidly, and <clears throat> see to it that we also learn from others in how we should do different things. Once again, Linköping is the head university, and today it's KTA Chalmers and the universities of Uppsala, Lund, Luleå, and Stockholm. And Wood Science Center, as I said, I already talked about this, but uh, today, 10 Forest companies being part of it. These are, of course, the ones that have come the furthest. They have most of the products that are already commercial. Stora Enzo actually bought one of the companies that came out of this for cup uh, packaging foam material something. Uh, so this has been a, a huge success and continue to be a huge success and continue to develop new areas of how do we use the forest, see to it that it is good for, for Mother Nature uh, and good for the Swedish forest industry. You talked about to be but not to be seen or seen doing it, which was the old way of, no, it still is probably. But in today's modern uh, information society, it's difficult to do and not to be seen to be do, do, do. You need to communicate what it's all about. And so 
even though, yes, we stand by it, we just want to see to it that we do things. We don't want to stand and go, look what we did. Uh, for us, this is probably the most important quote today, and that is to go from the old to what is about to come is the only tradition worth keeping. For us, that is the essence. I don't know if this is the right thing, though, to go from trains to airlines. Maybe we shouldn't have done that, but anyway. Uh, it's this, the, the quote that is the most important. And that is, of course, the way that we work in everything that we do. Now, that's me being the fifth generation, and I'm happy that I'm working with this. I have the best job in, in the world. I mean, I work with companies that we own shares in. I talk to them, see to it that they make as much money as possible so I can give away as much money as possible. It's an easy, yeah, it's a good job. Serious. But who wants to take over? As I said, when we were younger, somebody pointed the whole hand and said, this is the way you should do it. This is what you should do. Don't even try to go outside the, the, the uh, routine. About 12 years ago, is it? Sometimes I point a little bit. We, me, my brother, and my cousin started to talk about, oh, you know, we knew how it was when we were younger. We don't want it to be the same for the next generation. There are 31 in the next generation. They're getting old. They're between 11 and 43 now. The 11 is my daughter. I started late. My cousin and brother started earlier. So they're much older. How old are you, Fred? How much? 33. 33? Martina? Hmm. You're old. Anyway, we, 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 we said that we need to find ways of, of introducing them. Everything that they read and they see is scary. I mean, I can imagine. So we started to see to it that we included them in many ways in trying to inform them of, you know, what do we stand for? How come we are where we are? Uh, you know, try to see to it that they understand it's, it's not scary in that. Yes, it is big and, and it's a lot of responsibility if you want to. And I think that was the main point. And I looked at my, pointed at myself and said, no, I did not want to be part of that when I was in your age. So I took another route. Now I'm back. I want to work with this. But it's up to each individual, each of you, to decide what you want to do and which route you want to take. But we will take the opportunity to introduce you to everything that we know and all the experience that we have. But the decision is yours. Today, some work very hard to be part of it and say, raise their hand and say, yes, I want to be part of business or I want to be part of the foundations. And we try to guide them in their quest of reaching their own goals. We do not give them jobs. So, if they want to reach, they have to find their own steps. Yes, we will help, but we will not give them jobs. So we have used our network, other families that we have met in the same situation, just to see to it that they understand. We see to it that they are allowed to, I'm now a minute and a half over time, uh, that they uh, come with us to meet companies, they do their own uh, uh, visit at uh, different companies, just in an effort to see to it that they have an understanding. Okay? And then we have, in our case, we have a family council, where we as a family, depend, doesn't matter which generation, can sit down and talk about a lot of things. And we can help them in whatever question there is. We will have them up on stage later, and we will talk a little bit. And they will probably point at me and say, the fifth generation is not letting us do anything. <laughs> and they're going to sit there forever. So, you know, whatever you can do to help them to get away, please. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, uh, I want to uh, thank you. This is the end of my presentation. It's a little bit a short version of uh, how the family works. Questions we will take later after we've been sitting up here. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>